How many people want to be a spine surgeon? Great, great, I did my job. I've got three people that raise their hands. Okay, go ahead. I have two questions. So the cadaver had osteoporosis. Yes. Wow, that's a good question. Yeah, so you have to be very careful, okay? So in osteoporotic patients where the bone is thin, this is a permanent prosthesis, right? And so if it's too thin, the bone could subside, and that will cause pain. So one of the criteria that we do do, we typically don't do disc replacements in, you know, 80-year-olds, okay? Um, it's really more for the younger patient. Um, I'll tell you what's fascinating, though. If you, if you take that thought a little further, okay, so you come in and you're probably 18. I don't know how old you are, but you're probably 20-something, right? And, you know, you have a disc herniation and, and you need surgery. I really think that at, at your age, we would put an artificial disc in you, okay, instead of a fusion, okay, because it would restrict mobility and, you know, it's not, it, it, there's better options. So the question is, is that what happens to you when you become osteoporotic, right? What happens to you when you become 80? Is it going to fail? Is it going to subside, right? So, gosh, are we really doing that to patients now? And I don't want you to worry, okay? Because what happens is bone is a biologic living tissue. And if, if it feels stress, it reacts to it. So the bone will remodel, meaning that it will support it because it's a living tissue and your body is responsive to external environment. So the bone will feel it and they will support it, okay? It's just like when you send patients out of space. You know, there's a big research collaboration at UCLA sending astronauts because there's a huge problem when you send astronauts into space involving the skeletal system. What do you think that is? They stretch out, they grow, no, but that's, that would be great, but no. That, that is absolutely true. So the muscles, they get smaller, okay. And you in the back? Yeah, without regular stress, your bones don't realize that they need to keep remodeling as well. Right. They get like osteoporosis, basically. Yes, that's right. So that is a big issue of sending people out in space for long periods. They become osteoporotic really quickly because they don't have gravity. Okay, so the bone is living tissue and it reacts to the environment. Okay. Can you do this real quick? I have to uh, any other questions? Just take questions. They're not using the thingy, so I'm just going to put Sure, what's your name? Yeah. Ian. So. They, all the prostheses that we use, and this is what most people don't know, most metals that we use in humans are MRI safe, okay? The only problem is, is when you take the MRI, you get artifact. So sometimes you can't visualize the surrounding areas, okay? But these, most metals are always MRI safe. Like even if you have a hip replacement, which is a big piece of metal, I don't know if you've ever seen a hip replacement, um, or a big, you know, kind of if you've broken a bone and uh, the femur and they put a rod in, I'm sure you heard of that, or a big plate, all those are MRI compatible. Like you can go into an MRI and, you know, it won't, the magnet won't pull it out. But what will happen is, is that you'll get a lot of scatter artifacts. So the image quality will not be very, very good. Okay. Okay, you, what's your name? Garrison. Garrison, and then you in the back. Go ahead. Um, is it true that the... When you do a, just regular fusion, when you do a regular fusion, the chances of above and below the fusion hmm. have a chance of failing. Is that if that's true? Is that still true when you replace it like you just did? Wow. When, why did you even think of that question? Do you have some background in spine surgery? No, my mom had a fusion. Your mom had a fusion, <laughs> yeah. and did she have another fusion or? No, but I think she'll have to. She'll have to. Wow. Okay. So that is absolutely true, okay? So if you really think about it, your spine, I told you, like, you know, the bone, after 25 years, it's over the hill. You reach your max, you reach your prime. The skeletal, the disc is about the same way. You know, after about 30, maybe a little bit longer, the disc will start collapsing and degenerate, okay? And typically what happens is the bottom levels go first, so they collapse and they get stiffer, and then it cascades up. 
So even if we didn't do anything, let's say we didn't do any surgery for you, just your natural history of spending time on the planet, the lower levels would degenerate first, then that would get stiff, it'll put stress on the next level, that will degenerate, then it'll put stress on the next level, but this takes a period of you know decades, okay? And it's different for everybody. Some patients in their 80s have no degeneration, some patients in their 80s have lost three inches of height, and that's where you primarily lose height. It's not your bones shrink, it's just all the cartilage in between degenerates, and if you add all those up, those 30 segments up, you can get two or three inches pretty quickly. And so, yes, so when you do a fusion, that is the problem, because you've accelerated a little bit of the aging process. Does that make sense? You've taken a disc that moves, and you've isolated it, and you've restricted it. So typically what happens is, is that the chances of accelerating the disease above is certainly, it's not foregone, but the chances are increased, okay? So that's why people love artificial disc. That's why we've moved to this. It's more physiologic reconstruction. Does that make sense? We're actually regaining motion in some cases, okay? And we feel twofold. One, that improves function. So after surgery, you know, you're not limited. You don't feel neck stiffness. And two, it's the long-term effect. It's the fact that, you know, we're not causing that cascade. So are fusions, are fusions still more common? Though? Yeah, so I still think fusions are more common. Um, this is a relatively newer technique. So I'm gonna say maybe it's crossed the 50-50 kind of that threshold, meaning that if you, you know, if you were a patient, you had single level disease, you had a disc herniation, you had arm pain, some pressure was on your nerve root or your spinal cord, and you went to see a spine surgeon, I think now it's about 50-50. 10 years ago, it was about 90% would say fusion, 10% would say arthroplasty. But I think with the data, you know, it, some people are very conservative and you start seeing data. I think now about 50% of the surgeons would recommend cervical disc replacement over fusion. What's the hesitation on the... Um, a lot of it is just understanding it as technique. Surgeons by nature are very conservative, okay? Um, because we're dealing with patients, it's not a car. Right, so we're, you know, we're, it's a, they're by nature a little conservative. And then it's, it's the whole thing, like you guys are young, and this is, when I say this, you're gonna be like, that doesn't even make any sense. But as you get older, you start saying, wow, this makes a lot of sense. You know, the, the saying that old dogs can't learn new tricks? It's very apparent as you get older, right? So once your surgeon gets set in their ways and they have very, very good results with some certain procedures, sometimes it's very hard to, to get them to move away. You know, you can't convince them, my, my patients do great, I know how to do this operation. And in some cases, they're right. Maybe they shouldn't in reality, right? Because they haven't good results and, you know, there's always a learning curve with anything new. Well, the woman right there, I want to get back to you because I remember. I think you kind of touched base on it, but for like a knee or hip replacement, usually you need a revision after like 15 years or mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. um, how many years does this last before a revision? Okay, or? so we don't know. Okay, so the first implant, actually the device I showed you, the first implant in the US was done by myself in California, okay? And that was done in 2004. So the longest we have is about 15 years with that implant, okay? Now, obviously, you know, this is not how we do medical devices. I mean, we mechanically test these devices before we ever get to this stage. And if you really look at the wear characteristics, so a total hip, so we have a lumbar artificial disc, too, that goes in the lumbar spine. So if you look at the wear characteristics for a total hip, the lumbar artificial disc wear characteristics are about one-tenth that of a total hip. So one-tenth. If you look at the wear characteristics of a cervical disc versus the lumbar disc, it's about one-tenth of the lumbar disc. So one-hundredth of the total hip replacement. So we do think that these are very durable. It's, it's, I, I, I really feel that these are gonna last a lifetime without any need of any revision. Um, obviously, there are other issues that people require hip revisions. It's a different joint, okay? So this is a, it's called a diarthroidal joint. It has synovium, it's like the same joint of the knee and the hip. You have synovium. It's a little bit different than a monoarthroidal joint where it's just a disc, it's just cartilaginous. There's no fluid, there's no, so it's a little bit different joint. Um, but that being said, I think it's a great question and, and I do think that these will last my personal opinion, that these won't have catastrophic failures, okay? I wanna make sure that I get equal opportunity. I see you. Okay, over here. 
Uh, my question was, in scoliosis surgeries or correcting orthotic kyphotic spines, where do you draw the line between you know, this much stiffness versus yeah. actually correcting it? Mm -hmm. That is a really insightful question, you know, way beyond your years. You want to be a spine surgeon? Yeah, that's a good question. You should be a spine surgeon, and hopefully you'll figure it out. <laughs> that's my answer. <laughs> no. So this is the problem, okay? We don't have anything honestly in between. We have mobility, artificial disc, right? And we have incredibly stiff fusions. That's it, because we do titanium rods and screws. I don't know if you've ever seen a spine fusion, but that's what it looks like, screws and two rods, and we're trying to make things stiffer. And the longer you go, the stiffer you need to make it, because you really, you know, it's, that, that's the beauty of the spine. It's amazing, the spine is erect, but it's super flexible. Mechanically, that's hard to deliver, okay, because of failure. You bend a paper clip three times, it breaks, right? So we're almost, we have to almost just stiffen it up to a level where we just fuse the whole thing. So we don't have the in-between, okay? And that, no question, is a detriment to our specialty. Because what happens is, is that we fuse, and then the patient breaks down, and then we have to go higher, and the patients break down, and we have to go higher. And before you know it, sometimes some patients have a fusion of their whole thoracic lumbar and sometimes cervical spine, okay? So I do think that there is a possibility of somewhere in between, right? We just haven't gotten there. That is what I'm gonna charge you with. So would you, in personal preference, I guess, would you rather stiffen and fuse the entire spine to correct a scoliotic spine, or would you rather you know, just do a section of it and risk the uh, instability? So I think, man, how do you answer these questions? Have you done spine research? No, no spine research. Shout out a neurosurgeon who did oh. a bunch of spine surgery. Okay, but that okay. Was... Yeah, because these are pretty in-depth questions. So it's, it's really a hard decision. So I, and the crazy thing is if you had the other doctors at Swedish, spine surgeons, very accomplished in their field, very famous, you know, big time surgeons, I guarantee you that we would all disagree, okay? And we're the experts, okay? And the reason is, is that it's not like we don't know what we're doing. That's not the reason, okay? It's because we have not found the common solution. We have not found the solution. And so we're all trying to figure out how to get by, and that's why you have so much variation. So it, it, really, it really goes down to the individual case. You know, big fusion surgery to correct a deformity, for just the deformity, I don't think most of us would not do that. You would really have to have some issue of pain, discomfort, function, not just the scoliosis itself that would require it. And if you could fix the pain, and not the deformity, but the pain was the primary objective of what the problem was, without creating future problems. So if I could just do one level or two level and fix the pain, but not cause this patient to decompensate and require a bigger surgery and bring her back to the OR, then I think that most of us would say we want to do the one or two level, because we want to treat pain and function, not so much the deformity. Thank you. Oh, Linda. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Sure. So the, the second, just like I said, so, you know, there is a whole field of minimally invasive surgery, okay? Um, it's really using more image guidance instead of true and true kind of visual landmarks to fixate the spine. So typically what we did in scoliosis surgery, and now that you mentioned, we would open the spine all the way up. And what's amazing, if you look at the spine, all the muscles are in the back, right? When you look at the paraspinal muscles, the semispinalis, the longissimus, the multifidus, all those muscles are in the back. When you turn it over, just like we did the anterior portion of the spine, in the cervical spine, there's really no muscles there, right? It's very clean. You see the disc right in front. All the muscles are attached in the back. And so a lot of spinal procedures that go from the back in your, is it mom? Your mom has spine fusion? Was it done from the back? Yeah. 
So you see these big incisions from the back, we really have to take all this muscle off. And because of that, that carries a lot of surgical morbidity because we are detaching all these muscles. And that's where you get blood loss, is from the muscle, the muscle bleeds. So you know, another idea is, is that instead of detaching everything to get to the anatomic visual cue so you can put in screws, is using image guidance. So using imaging like fluoro, x-ray, CT, whatever, robotics, and we don't really have to you know, open the spine all up. We're gonna use imaging, indirect imaging, and then use guide wires and trocars to deliver the screw and to try to bury the rod with making little incisions for the screw and then sliding the rod underneath. Okay, so that's, that's one of the techniques of milling basic surgery. I think that's what we're doing, okay?